Thank you for joining us on behalf of the Sunday World Affairs Council. No, they, My name they, is Maria Sarchi, and I am currently the secretary and board member of the Sunday World Affairs. Two, 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 two. We're thrilled to partner this afternoon with National University and San Diego State University Center for War and Society to present today's distinguished lecture series, Beyond the American Lens, the Legacy of War, Transgenerational Trauma, Reconciliation and Healing by Lady Hazley, an SDSU professor of Greg Dye. Financial support and sponsorship for today's event and food catering by Nong Nong Tuo have been racially, graciously underwritten by the Bright Light Volunteers International, a nonprofit whose vision is to make the world a brighter place by creating a more peaceful, just, interconnected world where global challenges and opportunities are met by educated, compassionate global citizens and leaders. A big thank you to Katherine Greenberg, our Vice President of Sunny World Affairs Council and Bright Light Volunteers for making today's event. And now we're gonna have a quick welcome. Yes, a real quick welcome, but I wanna get in the way of these two distinguished speakers. I am John Cicero, I am the provost here at Nancy University. We are delighted to have you here. It's this type of speaker series that what a university is all about. So without further ado, let's get to the speakers and I hope you enjoy your stay and I hope you come back again. So thank you very much. Today's distinguished speakers. <coughs> Lei Li is an internationally known Vietnamese American author, philanthropist, peace activist and speaker. She grew up in Chile, Vietnam, during the American Vietnam War. She wrote two best-selling memoirs, When Heaven and Earth Changed Places, and Child of War, Woman of Peace. Based on her painful and ultimately triumphant journey from a traumatizing childhood in war ravaged Vietnam to her new life in America. Having grown up, in central Vietnam, as a woman, lately, shares a perspective that is unique when it comes to the Vietnam War. She received radiant uh, reviews for both books, including from the New York Times and the Washington Post, when Heaven and Earth Changed Places was included in the 1990s edition of the Reader's Digest, today's best nonfiction. Her memoirs, have been published in 17 different languages throughout the world, are now used for several universities as course materials to study women in history, the American Vietnam War, and other topics. In 1993, the books were adapted into the film Heaven and Earth, directed by the award-winning director Oliver Stone and starring Tip T. Lay and Tommy Lee Jones. Lately, life as humanitarian began after she arrived in the U.S. in the 1970s and became a U.S. citizen, but returned to her native Vietnam in 1986. Her shock from the devastation, poverty, and illness left by the war became the impetus for her two philanthropic organizations, East Meets, uh, Meets West, Foundation and Global Village Foundation. Both organizations dedicate their efforts to humanitarian uh, relief, education, and development to help rebuild beautiful Vietnam through providing basic needs, establishing revolving loan programs, and finding homes for several hundreds of orphan, uh, or orphan children. Hazley continues to lead groups and delegations in cultural and anthropological studies in her home village. Today, uh, helping us to moderate this uh, series, Greg Dallas is the director of the Center for and Society and the USS Midway Chair in Modern US Military History. He holds a PhD from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. <laughs> After graduate, graduating from West Point, he served for 26 years in the U.S. Army, retiring as a colonel. He's a veteran of both operations, Desert Storm and Iraqi Freedom. That is, specializes in Cold War history, 
with an emphasis on the American War in Vietnam. He has authored five books, including most recent called Vietnam, War and Gender in Cold War, Men's Adventures Magazine. Additionally, he has published scholarly articles in some of his field's leading journals to include the Journal of Cold War Studies, the Journal of Military History, and the Journal of Strategic Studies. So without further ado, please let's receive today our um, we're a honor to have you here today. Uh, we present you Beyond American Lens with Lake D. Tracy. It is my distinct honor to, to be sitting next to Lay Lee today. So um, obviously San Diego is the home for uh, Comic-Con. This would be like me going to Comic-Con and being a Star Trek fan and sitting next to William Shatner and James Kirk, right? So this is a big deal for me. So uh, I think what we would do is we would have a conversation for about 40 minutes or so and then give you some time for questions and answers uh, with Lay Lee. Um, and the way I wanted to approach this today was um, to kind of put... Lay Lee's history into a more contemporary context. And if we think about the recent unrest and the bloody fighting in Eastern Europe and the Middle East, I, I think it's important for us to talk about war as a human phenomenon, um, as a lived experience. And, and I think we often talk about war as an extension of politics, for those of you who have read Clausewitz. Um, but I, I think we do ourselves a disservice by not looking behind the curtain when societies actually go to war, by not examining what war does to families and to individuals. And, and I think what Lei Li has done is, is really given us a gift, an absolute gift for her honesty and her courage to, to share a very painful story of growing up in the midst of war. And that's what I wanted to, to, to focus on today um, about those experiences and how we might be able to learn from them and assess the world today, um, because I, I think Lei Li's um, personal history really is a, an invaluable teaching tool for all of us. So thank you so much for writing. Well, thank you for having me. Um, so you grew up in a time of civil war. Um, to you as a, as a young child and to your family, what was this larger war all about? You, you write, um, you know, as a child at one point, you, you saw that this is kind of a total waste, you called it. So as a, as a child growing up, what was this war around you all about? So first, I want to say thank you for coming today. Um, I've been in San Diego for that 53 years, and I owe you a lot. Uh, all of you who are citizens here in San Diego give me an opportunity, teach me a lot. Uh, my friend Kathy brings me to cheer. She's the one to be my boss, to be my uh, neighbor and friend and everything and everything. And so to live here in San Diego with a beautiful weather, beautiful place to be, I'm just so grateful and to be here with you today. And um, growing up in Vietnam, we really did nothing right here in San Diego. Um, I had a beautiful water bottles too, the mother and a baby, and uh, coconut trees and bananas uh, field and rice paddies and corn. Um, cat, dog, and chicken and pig, and just like you know, every village you will have uh, around to make a uh, little on and survive with. But uh, 19, I uh, born late 1949, or can say 50, and so in that that the uh, first four years of my life. Uh, the war uh, in Vietnam with the friends were there. And so the Vietnamese uh, who um, called Vietnam fought against the French. So that is what I remember my first four years uh, as a child to go up at the, the Frenchmen all over and how they take our chicken and duck and kill the pig and all that. Like it was there in the storm and then in four villages. So in 1954, when the war ended, I was um, a very um, happy and very, um, you know, village little girls. I feel like everybody uh, grow up in a village. We have everything around us to survive. And I'm happy with our parents, brother and sister, and uh, of course, um, freedom at the, at the building school. But in 1960, um, the things started to um, the, uh, we don't know about American then, but you know, um, I know that it's a new war case. So in 
So our 10 years old man, and then in 1972, that is really big. And as a young girl from the building, we had to live on both uh, sides. When there's night time, we live and work with the Vietnam, and at daytime, we live and work with the Sahih and some Americans who came as a advisor. So our world is starting to, everything is secret, everything is, you're not supposed to talk, you have to learn how to sing and dance for the both sides. And like the daytime, I have the shy shoes for the South Vietnam Army, I cook for them, for the laundry, and help them whatever they want to do. But as soon as the sun set, they went back to the base, and the Viet Cong come in and we do the same thing. So at the village, you're the young girl, I'm only 12 years old, but um, you're not supposed to say anything, you're not supposed to say anything. So that's why I learned both of songs from both sides. So the only way that we can survive in the village uh, day by day was to make sure that nobody got hurt, nobody got killed, nobody um, came to the prison camp, and nobody really um, tell anybody about anything, you know. First of all, we just hit, we don't know anything. And so, on the starting to 1983, 74, 75, that is when my building started to level just by the American. Um, on the every three buildings, as they call young, young, in the move from the building to my building, get my building get up in and up in the hill, the drier, drier land. And so that is when the rent we gain from other uh, villages to go to my village. And that was when hard times started for a villager because we don't know what happened. We don't know why the friends just left us. We had four or five years, very peaceful and very beautiful and very um happy with my family and holidays and worship our ancestors and looking forward to get married and have children. But then in 1964, 65, we become our own refugees and we lost everything. We lost the cow, we lost the water bottle, most of my uncle and auntie um, lost Everything you with the refugee camp, even though they have big houses and everything. But then 1974, I become the, the refugees um, after being in Virgil camp a couple of times and Kangaroo uh, court with the Viet Cong. And then my family knew that if I stay in the morning, I will die. They're like, oh, God, they much. And then it became the uh, refugees in the land that then to Saigon in 1965. So I left my village in 1965, which is I was 15. 16, I already had my first son and came back to the land, but cannot come to the village because right now it's all American base and go up there. So that is my childhood and memory of my time is a beautiful time. The time that were very peaceful, very um, <clears throat> childhood paradise. Um, we did not ask him for much except to grow up and get married and have children and have big family and die and bury the next our ancestors bring you up. Um, but that simple dream it didn't happen because of the war. And as today we talk about the war, and I see children and women in other countries we do the same as I feel. Put me back in the same spot, the same place, and um, it's just sad. There's nothing that happy that I can share with you all, except I'm here and we all live together. It's interesting. I, you mentioned in the book that uh, for for many of you, war would became just uh, a war for survival, <laughs> and unlike Americans who could declare victory and go home, like one of the characters says in the book, for you, it, it's it's lasting and permanent. Um, and I, I want to kind of return back to that a little bit um, and kind of ask a question about when do wars, if ever, really end. Um, so you were growing up and you're, you're, you're 
forced to work on both sides or you know to kind of navigate through this very dangerous space um and i think vietnam as a whole is kind of struggling with its national identity what does it mean to be vietnamese in this post-colonial post war II era um when you're a young child um what was appealing to the Vietnamese communist message? You talk early on about the young young child finding some of the messages appealing about um, encouraging national prejudice, prejudices about fear of outsiders or um, uh, talking about Vietnamese independence and nationalism. Can you talk a little bit about early on what was appealing to that message? Um, I'm the youngest. Uh, daughter of six children, and all my three sisters before me cannot read or write. My parents cannot read and write, but um, I'm lucky I went to third grade education in the building level. So I learned about Vietnamese history, mostly in 1,000 years we fought against China, 100 years we fought against the French in Japan. My family is in Vietnam, the uh, revolutionary family. And so we all learn about, of course, we fight for our freedom, we fight for the Vietnamese, we fight our land, our graveyard, our ancestor worship, we fight for anything that Mother Earth provides us. If anything that comes in and destroys that, whether it's a friend, the Japanese, the Chinese, and now American can. We have the same reaction. And 90 percent people in my building, unless they move out of the building to the city and be with the South Vietnamese. Otherwise, we live, work every day with the South Vietnamese, and we run under by the uh, South Vietnamese uh, government. But we always be in between. We have uh, time to do what you have to do. We have time to do what you have to do. We only ask him for you know, to leave us alone. You know, um, it's just so very sad that a lot of people, especially Vietnamese, we all know that we call each other brother and sister, uncle and auntie. And we come to the building, yeah, we say, I want a duck. Okay, I kill you a duck. If you want a chicken, I kill you a chicken. And we did whatever that we have to do for them from the day. But nine times the Vietnam came, we just we know that. They are the local people, they are people we know on our life, we grow up with, and so we can able to trust them and know that what they are. Mm -hmm. But the fact is we know that they come from the city. So that is how the villager that we know. We don't know anything beyond than that, because when we're talking about the word of communists or Gamsam, we don't know the word. We know it's the liberation of William Gaipom. And that is the we use in the truth in the, the, the building. And so to that time and you live with one government which is supported by the US and get like you uh, do the thing uh, they call the um uh action look or the uh they move all the people in the one Really? The strategic Hamlet right. yeah. 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 program. So it's a, a program run by the South Vietnamese government to basically forcibly move um, uh, villagers into protected strategic hamlets as a way to kind of separate the population from the, the Vietnamese communists. Yeah. President Zim do that. Under, under, to uh, separate her between the communists yes. uh, from not to the yeah. south so we can protect the people. So, and it was under President No Din Xiam. Yes. And so that is uh, when um, everything gets so aggressive and my building has become the resident camp and so many buildings are there. Yeah. So, so when you talk about the fight in which side, we help both sides so that we can survive, right. so that we can get one day of life. It's really, I mean, and, and in one way, I think tragically representative of what we're seeing today, that, that there's all this politics is happening up here about, in this case, Cold War anti-communism and containment theories and, and ideas about international relations theory and deterrence and, and all of that. And it, it seems completely irrelevant to what you're growing up on. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, 
My father, my mother born in 1908. And, you know, all her life, the church rose, you know, helped raise same children. But the two sons went to North, 1954, together with all my uh, father's side, uh, 18 of the members of my father's side family, all went to North. And supposed to be one for two years, but they stuck there for 20 years. And growing up and see how my mother is suffering with the, my brother, and then my second brother got killed in 1968, and then my father died in 1968. And then a young girl and growing up and witnessed the family just went through so much trauma time. When, you know, no express, nobody asked, how are you feeling today? Or anything can I do to help you? If nobody really care, we live or die. Nobody really understand how did we live and how do we survive? And if we die, we have a, a coffin to bury. And, you know, we want, how can we, we heal? And yet none of that, that everything is positive, everything that you connect with who and and how did your family know so and so, you know? And one in Georgia came, another one in other places, we don't know where. But yes, always questioning everything about our family. And but yet, a mother, I, I look back and I see 85% of them, mother was, you know, in Vietnamese mom, had the same feeling <coughs> in her children in the South or in the North. And now you see that mother and children in other country, they will do the same thing. And that is how sad, how sad they are, they bring to the man God. Did you get a sense that, that it was even possible to avoid the war? I mean, you're moving from small uh, village, uh, Ina. Kila, and then to, to, to Nang, and then to Saigon, and then yet the war seems to continue to follow you. Is it even possible to avoid it's only possible if the leadership between the White House in Washington, D.C., and the South Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. You know, how did people like me that finish the re education in the building? Or how could my father, mother, and, and sister who could not read or write? What did they know about the politics? Okay, in Vietnamese, we order, I mean, we follow what our leaders tell us. They are parents, our grandparents. And the people that tell us what to do, and then both sides tell us what to do, and we follow. We dare to question. We dare to say anything or complain. Complain to who? And that is the problem with a villager like us. And all we want to plant rice, take the fish and snail from the pond, and bring the family. It's a simple thing. So we never get asked, or we never get, you know, Complain to nobody. To nobody. Yeah, you say the book that the best we could do is to just get by. That's, get by. That's lucky if you get another day of life and more of Christ to see your family again for the next morning. Um, and I, I do want to kind of come back to this though, because you, you say you've become part of this endless machinery of terror and death, but there's also regeneration here. Um, and I, I want to kind of return back to the regeneration part of this. Um, so along these lines, <clears throat> um, you write about loyalty at both sides. Um, the, the Vietnamese communists and the Republicans are worried about loyalty. You say more than bombs and bullets and battles. Um, can you just like expand on that a little bit more about what that meant for your family and trying to, to compete in this space where Everybody is is competing for your loyalty. The loyalty, first the loyalty is for the heaven and earth because God is right up, right? The second is our ancestors in our motherland and our government, whatever side we are. So the loyalty, especially for women, is we put that on top of everything. Most of the time, men are not around. So the woman has to be loyal to her family, her husband's family, her community, her village, and her country. And that is the woman's role in us, carry on. 
The second loyalty is to you obey your authority. Whoever comes to your building, you obey and you follow. And then third is to make sure you accept their brain, taking care of your children, raise it right. Um, your family on both sides uh, have everything they need. So don't just annoy them. But also the Vietnamese say that the Vietnamese are not bad. When the war came, the woman had to stand up and fight them. So Vietnam could not be where they are today without Vietnamese women. The loyalty of women, just like I mentioned, they loyal from above and beyond. The war, the peace, the ministry, the bring family together, bring country together, and that is the loyalty. For Vietnamese people like myself in my building, if we can see the American or the friend or the Japanese, they're not Vietnamese. They look outside. And how could they can come in our country and strike our women, torture our men, burn down our houses, and destroy our buildings? Our men. And we can do nothing? Well, we have to fight back. It's no different from you bringing people from San Diego to Eskin, you go and, and beat me and all that. But my neighbor in San Diego will stand for me in Eskin, you will stand up. So because we're not educated well, we not have anybody <coughs> teach us about right or wrong, good or bad, we just only have to obey I order whoever come with a gun. We are voices, faceless, nameless. And we have no chance to say, look, why don't we sit down and talk? Who do you talk to? Everybody have a gun, everybody toy at us. And so it's just no chance for villagers like myself or my family or my villagers that have a chance to say, do it in deep time. It seems that the American presence is actually exacerbating the problem, making it more difficult to be loyal to the land. You mentioned how, um, the Americans and the Republican troops as well poured troops and firepower into the jung jungle around Kila, like a raging elephant stomping on red ants down in their holes. And, and so it seems that the American presence, and I wonder if this is a perspective for today, is actually making the problem worse um, by pouring in all this firepower, by making it far more difficult to, to be tied to the land and to the ancestors. That's just that when the Soviet and the military come with America, of course, they come on hel by helicopter, they come by tank, they come by truck, they come by jeep, and they come by ship, even, right? And so we learned that from the French. French did the same thing before the American arrived. When American came, it's even more powerful on the ammunition and on the uh, supply that they carry. On the other hand, that of Vietnamese, called Viet Cong, they have nothing except for one hand grenade and one gun and maybe a few bullets and everything is by foot. And they are on the ground all the time, so we don't, most of them, we don't know where they are. But if we know them where they are, we have to protect them. Because one Viet Cong died, just like my family, two Viet Cong died right in front of my uh, front door. And then my mother sent it to the Kangaroo coach and send me to my brain. Same with the South Vietnamese um, army who took my house to their base every day because it was a big house and big dog and my father had a well. And so they used our house, their whole base every day. So if one of them got killed, the whole building will be questioned thanks to the fortune camp. And we just want to make sure that no one got hurt or no one got killed while they at our home and their base. So both sides use our house and their base. And both of them, we had to obey, we had to take order, and we had to make sure that no one fight with one another. <laughs> so what did we know about, again, Politics. What do we know about American coming in to help Vietnam? I'll tell you a story how did I start to wake up. <clears throat> I was 16 and I was six much pregnant after I left from Saigon and back to the And my sister, Lorna, already woke in a bar and she had an American boyfriend. 
And so when she came home uh, with her boyfriend came home, um, I had to be out the street because she did have a small studio and she sleep on the bed and I sleep on the floor. When her boyfriend come home, I had to be out. So so rain and cold and everything. So he always tell me, give me beer. Uh, go get me sandwich. He said, so I always be with him when when he around. So one day I asked my sister, asked him, why does he come to Vietnam? And he said, he here to help the Vietnamese people. But then I started to question, okay. But then I remember that it was the South Vietnamese when they come and back in our house, they were here to fight against the communists. So that help Vietnamese, you know, villagers to be happy. But then they left, but then the Viet Cong say the same thing. You have to help us. We're here for you so that you can support us. So all these three group of people is fight for Vietnamese. People like me, people like my family, and people with my religion. Know nothing about what? Just take an order and now no home, no refugee. And all of this thing happened. And so I just started to think, ah, all of these people, if they just ask, you know, get a chair. If you ask, how could you uh, feel today? Uh, would you want us to be here to help? And you will know. We will say, no, please go home with your family. Just leave us alone so we're going to plan the price and take care of okay, it. You know, it's simple, but nobody yeah. asked. And nobody wants us to suffer, but at the same time, everybody suffers. And everybody thinking they do the right thing for the Vietnamese, and not everybody dying in our country for no reason. Yeah, you're right that we, we knew little of democracy and even less of that communism. Okay. So when did you start to shift and, and find the, the communist message less appealing? Um, what what was that kind of turning point where you, you thought that um, that message was no longer attractive to either you or your family? I have to tell my mother to get to the coach. And they killed me once before. And my father killed himself. My mother and my brother died in the battle. I left the uh, Nan and went to Saigon in 1955. In Saigon, I see different. I see that. You know, people have everything, they're so rich, they're so wealthy, and you'll be ready with me. No folks, no home. And it just, uh, when I got in point, I said, okay, now I can be in Saigon. I can be, uh, now I have to return to the village and live the way it was. But then I become pregnant with my boss. At 18, I had to come back to Dunan, and that's when I ended up staying with my sister, Lon, who was for Americans, who moved in the bar and you know, brought American home. So that is part of our society from that on. And then I started to learn English and start to do some black marketing with American, and I learned how to make a living to support my son and my mom, um, and my father back in the building. Uh, everybody ended up the same road, walk on the same path, just to survive. There are some things that, when you're talking about Vietnamese loyalty again, I grew up all family talking about the woman who sold herself for the Frenchman, who been prostitute for the Japanese or for the French, and we really do never were upset that. Would never thought, oh, that is not Vietnamese woman way. But when American came, my sister will become the prostitute and myself. Just so that I can buy a house for my mom and I can buy a place for my son. This is a culture distorted. My father would not never wear except or never would think that, you know, uh, that, that we grow up and, and, and sell ourselves to America or go invade or whoever to survive. But
but yet the war brought out of that. It's just simple ring in the building, it no longer matters. So this wasn't just impacting your family, clearly it was, was impacting the entire society. The whole culture, culture. the whole culture. Every block in a bar, every block in the province was um, the place, the hotel, um, everything that we value of the culture, the tradition, uh, the asset, the worship, is now a big block, big tent, big everything leveled. You know what about the house that is built by the French? Very, very wealthy buildings. And here, yeah, overnight, overnight, everything just cleared up. All the pond filled up. All the big house is gone. The paint, the water, water flow, just rolling away. <laughs> it's just how do you feel if you see the whole building burn down? Just overnight. You know, just one day. And that is what. The building was like where I came from. Every day, just like that. But now, all the people are already in Red Fuji. Red Fuji came and um, put on the front there, it's just an open, open uh, field for Americans to go and come and start with me. <laughs> I've been there 53 years and that 40 years I'm working between Vietnam and US. I do to heal the wound. But you can see it never can heal. There's so much, so much to, to share. Every Vietnamese has a story to share. Every Vietnamese has something in fact on their life. No matter how good Vietnamese is here today in America, so many generations and so but if we were so well, we become well educated and build up their life with so much grace. But I think that deep down, the world has never been good at myself. What did you learn from your transition from this war torn society was being experiencing this tragic on people to, to coming to America? What was that transition like for you? And, Tell me in America, 1970, you know, no Vietnamese there. Mm -hmm. And um, I had with my husband, who was uh, 35 years older than me, and with two sons uh, at her 20 years old. What did I know? Nothing. I moved into alcohol, murder, and then in 70 years, and I remarried in 1975, and I came to the um, uh, Claremont. The transition up into 1975, my life is okay. Whatever in Vietnam is in Vietnam. But very hard for me that when I first arrived in 1970, was uh, I lived with my uh, husband and his family. Um, he had a World War II veteran, almost he had two sons and a brother-in-law in the Army Navy, and they served in Vietnam. And even though I live here in alcohol, his two sons still in the name, and one of his uh, brother in law is um, work for the Navy and travel back and forth in Vietnam you know, and San Diego. And so it's very odd to, you know, they talk about the war and they were even in news. We watch the news, what the God guy come on and announce and talk about the war. And every time that they say an American die and born there and put in a bag and killed on an airplane and say they want to go, they look at me and say, shame on you, shame on you people that you kill us. I see they get run, get out of the water, how to be at. And every time they look at the building you burn down and they look, there's no be woman carry you. With children on the back, and they just suffering like like we see now today. And they look at me and they say, "Oh, same one. You people like to go out and like to kill each other." And here I have no boy. I have no way to say that we won. We did not want war. We just want to live out alone, you know. And every time that um. My husband, he worked because he's a he worked for R A M K and engineering. So he been in Vietnam and he he know he he see what's going on. 
So he looked at them and he just shook his head and walked away. He had no no reaction and no no protesting on my side because he don't know what to say to them. The people here totally had no no connection. And so for all that, then I always say, what do you know about art? What do you know about this? I mean, they thought that they're like we're just a monkey, a swing on a tree, and there's no education. They asked me, would you ever see a TV before? You know what TV? You know radio? And I look at them and I say, God, we are not, it's not like that. You know, we have money. But I have no money. I have no home. And that is when the book will come into mind. I say, I always say, I will tell you about our war. You don't know anything about us. Let me tell you how we feel about this war. And that is why um, I start to plan the sea to write about it in the book. Because nobody knows, nobody understands. There's a historian, Marilyn Young, and she talks about how for Americans, far too often, war is invisible. And I think that's why this is such an important work because it makes it visible. So, it's still only voice up yeah. to today. It's only voice for God and me really. So a couple more and then we'll, you okay? Yeah, I'm okay. Um, so, I get a sense from reading the book and, and, and listening to you now that if I ask the question, do, do wars truly end? I, I think I might know the answer, but I'll, I'll pose it anyway. Do, do wars really end? In a paper? Yeah. In a policy? Right. In a <laughs> leaders? Might the deal? Uh, how many billion? The U.S. can support South Vietnam, and how many million the uh, Russia support the North? They're the one have the answer. But the war is, has not ended. The Vietnam today is still landmine that we work and help to support the remote landmine. The agent oil system, the often that we take care of, Spencer system that we support them. It's saying right there. And so the war is not and how many US will not back and kill themselves at the, the war end? How many South Vietnamese died and how many suffering death? Andre at the, the war is 20 years and wild by the United States. That could be a normal the poorest country on earth. And in 1986 when a country goes to Vietnam the country is starvation. And that is when I just wake up and I say, it is not going to be like that. I left Vietnam in 1970. It's very wealthy, it's very rich, it's very, you know, uh, okay for people in the city. They don't know what the war looks like in my building or in other villages, but in the city, it is a good life. And now, it's only 16 years, 1986, I come back. The country is a poor country. Mm -hmm. Why is that? And that is when I start to give up everything. I have five houses and a restaurant, and I have some money to play with. But you know, I give up everything and uh, to write the book and to help to bring the U.S. Vietnam veteran and their family back to Vietnam. Because their point of view is to go to Vietnam so they can help Vietnamese people. That is their heart and mind, right? However, they do whatever they did there between them and God, I don't know. But now Vietnam is need of support and it is need help with you know you see today in the Middle East. So that is when I started to set up a nonprofit foundation called East Week West so I can bring that. And that is the healing start. In 1988, I traveled back to Vietnam with a group of U.S. Vietnam veterans of 22 of us. And it's a tech of, uh, tech offensive in 1968, and now it's 1988. On the year, I bring them back and we travel from uh, 
uh, have Saigon with Danan and then Wei, and everywhere we have a big celebration there. And for families and her back and forth, what I witnessed there was in 22 grow up veterans. Some of them working for CIA, some of them working Navy, Army, I don't know. And some journalists and photographers, they all came to see. And so we met and we talked. Everybody was nervous, but he's supposed to have one more, but he got a bath. I forget to make up. He cannot make it again. And so how to wait? What I see that, you know, we have a all long table and we have all the share up and, you know, have a big party in the past. And, and so, yeah, um, <laughs> I mean, man, we walk in with all red and green and all different color with table that, oh my God, I don't know what he is, but only one man and he took it and came. And everybody took it very nervous, you know, and then they start to share and they start to introduce himself as he's the one that said after 1960, um, eight and friendship and all that. And then all the veterans, you know, because they come with the PTSD and we just know it because we, you know, we have a doctor in the team, but still we really worry. But then, you know, after the man talking and laughing and, you know, he said, yeah, I got to kill you guys one and you didn't kill me, you know, and all that kind of thing. But then, yo, you know, said them, yo, and they started to sing and they started to sing and then they started to cry and they started to cry. And I witnessed one evening in about three to four hours. And I see that every veteran, the group is mailed out. It healed. It opened the heart up, opened the soul up. From that moment on, we can see there is a healing if we can bring the two groups together to help you to me by reviewing the country, help the poor people, and do whatever they can to fulfill the tour of duty back in the point that they're going to do. That's simple. That is very simple. That all my dreams were. And so for the last uh, almost 40 years, that's what I've been doing, just doing that. So, I've been here only 75 years, maybe the most of the 20 years. I want to leave something that with good feeling, with something that, that can help other humanity, help the mankind to talk A and D, and from B to C. We need to bring all the young Vietnamese generation come to Vietnam, see their ancestors very young, visit their play where they born or their parents buried. That is really important to us. Back to a loyalty woman role. That is simple like that. That will not be done. Uh, it's been powerful. I, I think this is a wonderful line at the beginning of the book where you say that anger can teach forgiveness and hate can teach us love and, and war can teach us peace. And I think that's. Then what can I do? I mean, I can fight again. You know, Vietnamese, we say, we can ban on jump down. You cannot get a stand and hold up the sky. The problem is just so big. I cannot do anything. But, you know, one person, I'm saying, one of you now, one person can make a difference. You can make a difference how small and how big and how little. We have a role to play. It doesn't matter if Vietnam or Middle East or South of Order. And they help and you love them. And that is the comparison that it might be. You know, John was 75, and you can drive and work and do everything. That is the thing God so that I can do more. Thank you. Well, I used to tell my cadets when I was teaching at West Point that there are different forms of courage. And I think we saw an example of courage today.